1 Corinthians chapter 10 and then Daniel chapter number 1. And I'll kind of, this will kind of be the theme. I like to do things, obviously, like we did last year where we kind of had a theme throughout the whole week and hopefully we can build upon each message. But I would like to deal with the subject matter this week, hopefully, of temptation. I didn't hear a whole lot of shouts. <laughs> Our main text will be 1 Corinthians chapter 10, but... Oftentimes, the Christian life is reactionary. We react and we respond instead of prepare. And so we're real good at preachers, especially Bible believers. We're not preaching against the Catholics and the Muslims and everybody else because we don't have any of them in here. Yeah. We, we don't have any queers in here either, so we don't have to preach on that. Amen. We're preaching to Bible believers. Okay, so we're going to try to say some things and preach some things that's going to help us. And we're real good about pointing out Everything that's bad, and believe me, it's going to come through some. We're going to preach on your phones and your computers and all your social stuff. We'll hit all that, but we're real good at preaching on what's bad and telling you what not to do, but we don't tell you what to do. And it's good to dump out the old coffee, but you got to put something new in there. And so hopefully throughout the week we can deal with some things as we work through this to get some help not just reacting and responding. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 that we should walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. To be circumspect, Ephesians 5.15. To be circumspect is to know what's going on around you because of the word circle. Oftentimes, all we do is react in what's in front of us, and if you wait until it's in front of you, you're not going to be able to react or respond the right way. And we need to be prepared as Christians for this thing right here because every single, single one of us, from the smallest to the biggest, will deal with this until the rapture. And so hopefully we can get some help this week. Our main text will be 1 Corinthians 10, kind of the theme as you look at it, verses 12 and 13. We'll read this and pray and then we'll, work, we'll look at Daniel. Wherefore, he says, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Let's pray. I'm going to ask Brother Jay, will you pray for us, please, Brother? Amen. Now come over to Daniel chapter number 1, if you will. Very familiar story. Great passage of Scripture. I'm sure all of you know the story here. Daniel chapter number 1. You know how that Daniel came back from the captivity. He's some of the descendants there of the kings of Judah. And you'll notice in verse number 6, you have Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Verse 7, unto whom the prince of the eunuch gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Verse number 8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, or with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. 
and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenances of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou hast seen, deal with thou thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. We'll stop there for the sake of time. This is a great passage. And it's great, I think, especially for youth camp because it focuses on young people. Here's Daniel as a young person. Not Daniel as an 80-year-old man getting the revelations there in Daniel chapter 10 and 11, but Daniel as a young person making a decision early on to cement himself in the ground for God. He made a decision to say no to the world and yes to God. So as we begin to talk about temptation, as we tackle this issue, I believe really fundamentally from the very beginning, from the get-go, we've got to get the mindset of Daniel to go ahead and step across the line and make a commitment to say no to the world and yes to God. No to the world and yes to God. Just a few things from this passage. I want you to notice, first of all, that Daniel had to plan. You want to take notes? I guess we could write these up here. There has to be a plan. Daniel had to plan. They say if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. You know, you have all these intentions. You know, I went to camp and I got excited about the Bible. And I got excited about Jesus. And I got excited about singing some of the songs. Well, if you don't plan on doing something with that excitement, it's just going to die down. It's like a roller coaster. You go up and then all of a sudden gravity just brings you all the way back down. So, well, I really want to read my Bible. Okay, where is your Bible reading schedule? Surely you've made plans to read it. So I'm really going to be praying. Okay, when is the time you're going to designate to pray? There has to be a plan. Now, to plan is to think. Okay, the plan, for a real basic definition, to plan is to think. Take your Bible, I want you to see this. Go to Isaiah chapter 28. And if you keep your hand in Daniel, we're going to come back to Daniel. But I want you to see this passage here. I was looking up these words, and this just jumped off the page. Isaiah chapter 28. The plan is to think. Answer me. Is it possible to think the wrong thing? Amen. So if the, if the plan is to think, is it possible to make the wrong plans? Amen. What if an architect lays out the wrong plans for the, uh, for the construction crew? What's going to happen? They're going to follow the wrong plans and they're going to build the wrong structure. So there's a possibility as you enter this stage of planning to battle temptation, you may plan wrong. You may think wrong. And if you think wrong and plan wrong, then your outcome is going to be wrong. In Isaiah chapter 28 as we think about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, remember we read the verse. Some of you probably have it memorized. Great verses. By the way, I would highly recommend, I know you have all these memory verses, but dealing with this subject of temptation, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13 should be memorized. What's that verse number 12? Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. That's the first key to this whole thing. Let him that thinketh he standeth. To plan is to think. Okay, if you think there's no problem with this, then you're not planning correctly. If you think wrong, you're going to plan wrong and you're going to wind up trying to go about the wrong, solving the right problem in the wrong way. And that's exactly how the devil will get you tripped up. So your mind can deceive you. Amen? Your mind can deceive you. Look in Isaiah chapter 28 for this. Isaiah chapter 28, he's dealing with some stubborn nation, uh, nation of Israel, the northern kingdoms, the uh, Ephraim there, verse number 1, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower which are on the head of the fat valleys. Look in verse number 2. The Lord hath a mighty and strong one which is a tempest of hail and a destroying storm as a flood of mighty waters. Overflowing shall cast down the earth with his hand. Look in verse 3. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. Look at that. The crown of pride. Where does your crown go? On your head. You're in Daniel, right? You're still in Daniel? Flip over to chapter 5. Look in Daniel chapter number 5. That's why Jesus said you've got to love God with your mind. 
Because if you just love God with your heart and you don't love God with your mind, then you're going to think the wrong things about God that you love with your heart. There are some people that are sincere. They are genuine. They love God with their heart, but they're thinking wrong about God. Therefore, they're planning wrong. Amen. And if you plan wrong, you're going to have problems. Look in Daniel chapter number 5. Daniel chapter number 5, come down. This is the story of Belshazzar. And, you know, he was full of pride and he didn't want to listen to God. Notice the judgment, Daniel chapter 5, come down to verse number. This is when Daniel gives the answer to him. Verse number 20, he's referring back to his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar. But when his heart was lifted up, look at this, and his what? Mind hardened in pride. So the first problem people have with this area of temptation is they think that they're okay. The preacher's preaching about somebody else. Preacher, get up there and preach on Buddhism. Preach on, preach on Islam. Preach on the Catholics. Preach on the sins of the flesh. Preach on you know, this music out here that everybody's listening to. Preach on all these things that I'm not doing. We have sins. We have problems. First step is to say, I'm not standing. We were talking earlier about some people that got out of the race and, and we were saying, you know what? If it wasn't but for God's grace, we'd get out of the race. Amen. You know? And that's the honest truth. Never get to the place where you think wrong about yourself. You think you're a pretty good Christian. You think you go to a good church and that's going to make you good. You think you've got the right Bible so that's going to make you right. You're thinking wrong. Your mind can deceive you about you. Amen. And you think you're pretty good. Oh, man. I'm here to tell you, you are a rat. Yeah. You Amen. can be deceived. Amen. Your mind will deceive you. Uh, you must think correct, factual thoughts about God. Anybody know Philippians 4.8? Philippians 4.8. Turn over there. It's a great verse. Philippians 4.8. This deals with thinking. This deals with planning. Philippians 4.8. Paul was a good Baptist preacher. He closed the book of Philippians twice. <laughs> Finally, chapter 3, and then he gets to chapter 4, finally again. <laughs> He's trying to put down the landing gear. You know how Baptist preachers go. You know, they, and, fine, and in conclusion, that means i got 30 more minutes. <laughs> Philippians 4, verse number uh, 8. Finally, brethren... Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Thoughts become imaginations. Right? You take little words, you put them together, they become sentences. You take sentences, you put them together, they become paragraphs, and those paragraphs become ideas. Ideas have to do with plans. They become imaginations. If your imaginations are not right, if they're not just, if they're not holy, if they're not pure, if they're not virtuous, if they're not true, then they will be imaginations of idols. They'll be false idols that you have concocted in your own mind, not just your heart. The Bible talks about having idols in your heart, but you know you can have idols in your mind. And it's going to get you offset from the very beginning where you won't even deal with temptation in the right way. Wow. So we have to, to plan is to think. We must think right. We must plan. And to plan is to be convincing. You have got to be convinced intellectually with your thoughts about what that book says about you. And you talk about the, the root of repentance, that's, that's really the root of it. Nobody's going to repent if they're not convinced. I want to say this, and I'll probably say some other things. Your age, you're facing a lot of temptations now that are, have way more effect to get you addicted to them. More so than in my generation. Okay, some of us older people, we grew up in a little different age. We still had sin. The heart is still deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But you have some things that can get its claws in you in a very, very quick, concise, long manner. And it's going to be difficult for you. But here's what you've got to do. You've got to be convinced from the beginning about yourself and about what God's Word says about yourself. Or you're never going to be able to be honest. When he talks about the, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, that has to do with that. How can you wear a breastplate of righteousness if you're not right? 
How can you be right if you're not honest and right with yourself? So you must plan. To plan is to be convinced. We must be convinced. I want to put the responsibility on you young people in here. I know we always put the responsibility on the parents. Because the Bible says, broad is the gate and wide is, wide is the gate and broad is the way which leadeth unto destruction. And many there be which go in there at. There at. More are going to hell than heaven. Amen? Amen? Right. That's based on Bible prophecy. So when we think about young people, all we can think as parents and as preachers is, I've got to get all this stuff away from them. I've got to put them in a box. I've got to build a cage around them. I've got to protect them. And don't get me wrong. I believe we ought to have certain standards of righteousness. Some things we're just not going to give up on. Amen. Amen. We're going to have pulpits. We're going to have preaching. We're going to have hymn books. We're going to have the old time religion. We're not changing that stuff. But sometimes our mindset has gotten the idea that we as preachers can actually control the morality of our church members. You can't do that. And may I submit to you parents in here, and may I submit to future parents in here, that you cannot control ultimately the destiny of your child. There's been many a Bible-believing parent that has worried themselves sick. I'm talking about not just the little kids, but when they've already graduated, moved off to college, or already got out of the house because they went the wrong way. Good parents can turn out bad kids. And it's not on them, it's on the kid. So I just don't believe that. I just believe train up a child the way it should go. When he's old, he won't depart from it. Okay, let's just ra erase the rest of the Bible and take that as our only verse. That's one verse, and you've got to take the verse in context. If you take that mindset that you will control the destiny of your child or everything's on your parents, my parents shouldn't have let me have a phone. My parents shouldn't have let me listen to that. My parents shouldn't have been... Get off of that. You're not thinking right. You're not thinking right. You're not going to battle temptation with your parents' standards. You have to battle temptation with the standards God has convinced you of. You have thought about it. You've prayed about it. You've been convinced about it. You say, well, I just think this all the parents. Okay, well, let's blame God for Adam and Eve. It's God's fault. If he was a better parent, they wouldn't have went astray. So I'm tired of taking the respect. And as a preacher, sometimes I'm thinking, man, if I'd have done more, if I'd have done this, I can't control my congregation. They can go out and watch whatever they want to watch to on TV or YouTube or, or listen to music or hang around people. I'm not a spiritual policeman. And your flesh is not your spiritual policeman. You can't fight the flesh with the flesh. The idea that you fight the flesh with the flesh is contradictory. You fight the flesh with the Holy Spirit of God. You fight the flesh by feeding the Spirit of God and ignoring the flesh. All right, you must plan. You must plan. Let's just don't blame it all on our parents. Well, you know, when I was two years old, my daddy, he spilt some water on me. <laughs> Never since then, you know, I've just been mean to people. Ever since then, I just want to run over people. It's foolishness. Quit, quit blaming everybody. It's this very same thing in the Garden of Eden. God says, Adam, what's going on? The, 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 the woman you gave me. What happened, Eve? The serpent. This Always somebody else. You've got to think right. You've got to be convinced yourself. You're going to be tempted. And God's not, the, we'll get into this later, but God's not the one that's going to tempt you. All right, let's look in Daniel chapter 1. Notice verse number 8. You must plan, but number 2, you must purpose. And this takes it a step further. This takes it a step further than just planning. Planning has to do with thinking with the mind. Planning is thinking right, but purpose is believing right. Now we move from the, heart, from the head to the heart. And you've got to have the head and you've got to have the heart. Okay? All head and no heart, that, that's pretty dull. I mean, well, if I got up here and said, okay, we're just going to read Daniel. We're just going to read the whole book of Daniel for our lesson. There's, there, there's, no, there's no practical anything. Preaching has to do with a man's life in action as he's telling you what the Bible says. And God takes a personal practical testimony of an individual and he uses that with the act of, act of, act, he activates the word of God through that. And God wants you to do more than just think about it. Some of you, the problem is your head. I have talked to, and I know Pastor Kim, Gene, Gene's talked to intellectuals before, the academia. 
And you get to talking to them, and they say, well, you know, there's just no way. I haven't seen Jesus Christ. I just don't know that he exists. You know, how can you say you believe something you don't see? And you go around and around and around and say, okay, you know, George Washington didn't exist. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, that's just impossible. History said, well, history says Jesus. Well, they have, you know, they have portraits of, of George Washington. <laughs> well, I've never seen George Washington. I told a guy one time like this, I said, if I believe what you believe, if I really believe that up here, I will be sitting in my room so nervous and upset that I would not move. Because I would think, you know, there's a possibility when I grab the doorknob, somebody wired a bomb to it. There's a possibility there's going to be an earthquake, and if I step over here, I'm going to fall through. There's a possibility that you would go crazy if all you do is right between your, in, in your noodle right here. Your planning has got to go from just being convinced of something up here and actually believing it right here. That's why he says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. A lot of people confess with their mouth what they have up here. But he says, thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart. Amen. That God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Some people go to hell by missing it by 18 inches. The distance between their head and their heart. All right, plan is a think right. Purpose is believing right. Acts chapter 11, verse number 23. Well, the, the Bible says the disciples helped the people there that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Purpose of heart. 2 Corinthians 9 talks about giving. And as Bible believers, we believe in giving. We believe in obviously tithing and giving and contributing to ministry. But the whole key is not to give because you have this list that you've come up with or everybody wants you to give a certain amount. It says, as he hath purposed in his heart, so let him give. It's got to be felt with the heart, not just thought about with the head. Psalm 17, 3 says, Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast proved mine heart. This lines up with man's spirit as well. Acts chapter 19, verse number 21. So it's more than being convinced. You can get convinced up here, but when you have purpose of heart, you get convicted. There's a conviction. And a conviction is something that you're willing to die for. You know, there's, there's a difference in a conviction and a preference. Some things are preference. And as Bible believers, we have to be careful because some things we have, it's because we're, we have preferences about some things. And sometimes, because we're dogmatic in one area, and we have convictions in one area, we think everything in our Christian life has to be just as dogmatic. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. You want to make sure you understand the difference in a conviction and a preference. A conviction is like, Jesus Christ is born of a virgin. There's no doubt about that. I believe that. Okay? A preference is, I, I like going to church on Wednesday night. I believe in having Wednesday night prayer meeting. Some churches have Thursday night prayer meeting. Okay. Thursday, Wednesday. You see what I mean? Conviction. King James Bible is a conviction. Well, so just use, use the Bible of your preference, you know. Go to the church of your choice. No. Go to the church of God's choice. Amen. Conviction. It's more than being convinced in the head. It's to be driven. It's to be resolved. It has to be determined. Uh, it's to be committed. This is personal com being personally committed to something. You say, yeah, my mom and dad does this. And let me say this, young people. You are to obey your parents and the Lord. The Bible says this is right. You want to have a long life? Obey your parents. You say, why? Because if you don't, they'll beat the tar out of you. That's why. Amen. <laughs> Do what your mom and dad say. Obey them. But eventually, the day is going to come. You have to develop your convictions. They can't pray for you. They can't read the Bible for you. They are not going to be there when you are tempted. You're going to have to have some backbone, some determination, some conviction to say, I'm going to say no to the world and yes to God. I'm going to say yes to Jesus Christ. You've got to have conviction. If you don't have that purpose, if you don't have that determination, the world's going to walk all over you. Like we preached last year with patterns, some of you are already developing patterns of being run over. Look, I know some of you may be more timid, you may be more sweet and kind, and I understand that. Everybody don't have to be a loud mouth. Everybody don't have to go around and boss everybody around. But there comes a time you just say, hey, I'm a Christian. The best thing to do is the first time you meet somebody, let them know up front. They start saying something, say, hey, well, I'll pray for you about it. So, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian, so I'll pray for you. 
They're like, Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. You don't have to say a whole lot nowadays. Just carry your Bible to school, you know. It's amazing. It's amazing how much fear a black book like this. Don't go get one of these, you know, uh, uh, Bibles. They make them now where they look like another book, you know. Oh, yeah, they have these new versions. I got one in my office. They have a new version. It, it looks like a woman's magazine. Seriously. It looks like a magazine. It's, a, it's one of these new living versions. And it's a, it has, a, has a, like a lady, on, a girl, young girl on the front. And it has like a, a 15 beauty tips. How to find a husband. I'm serious. I have it. That thing's about 10, it's, a, it's about 10 years old. I have it for, you know, Bible comparison. I've got about 50 new versions. The preacher's got to have that kind of job. But here's the thing. Be bold in your witness for Christ. Be convicted about something. If you know something's right up here, you need to believe it down here. You need to come face to face with the Lord and say, okay, God, you said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Amen. It settles it whether you believe it or not, but it ought to settle it in your heart. Amen. Purpose is being convicted and committed. I want to say this about Daniel. You'll notice in the text as we work through this thing, Daniel purposes in his heart that he's not going to defile himself. Verse number 8 before the food's passed out. There has to be personal commitment. That's you, not your parents, not your youth pastor, not your friends. You can't live off somebody. You ever notice in the Bible God never has grandchildren? He has children. Are you a child of God? When were you saved? What about your prayer life? What about your time with the Lord in the Bible? Personal commitment. But it's got to be more than that. It's got to be prior commitment. Daniel made up his mind before the temptation was in front of him. You see, youth camp's a great time to make some commitments. You go back to, to school in a few weeks, right? Next week or next or a couple weeks after that, you're getting ready to go back. You need to make up your mind now. Yeah, that's really good preaching. We need this. You need prior commitment between you and the Lord before you ever face this. Once you make up your mind, and you need to write it down. Now, you guys, you don't have diaries, amen? amen. No, no diary, no, no twinkle toes around here, right? You have, if you have something you write on, we call it a journal. All right? A little more manly. You girls, you have a diary, whatever, you know, it's frilly. It's got little flowers on it, and it's pink. And, you, know, you write how you feel in there. But you guys, you need to write down some stuff, too. Take your Bible, you know, you can write, so you can write down by that verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you can say, today I'm resolved. Oh, that's good. I'm resolved to serve Jesus. That's really good. And, you may, and you put the date on that thing. It's an Ebenezer stone. It's something that you go back to to remind yourself, I made that commitment then. So when the temptation comes, the Holy Spirit says, uh -uh. hey, you remember? Remember me and you back there at youth camp on top of that mountain? Remember when you prayed and you made that commitment? And you're like, oh yeah, hey, I'm a Christian. And then it helps you in your fight in temptation. Prior commitment, personal commitment. Uh, in New England years ago, the uh, Coast Guard was always on active duty there. And off the New England coast, they had this bad accident. And the tide was going out and the weather was awful. And they got the call and the old captain says, all right, let's get ready and let's go. And one of the uh, guys that was just kind of standing by there, kind of on the staff but not going out on the fleet, he began to question the captain. He says, look, you know, if, 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 you, if you guys go out there, you're probably not coming back. I mean, let's just be honest. We know they shouldn't have been out there and went through the whole thing. If you go out there, you're not coming back. You know what that old captain said? He goes, we have to go out there. We don't have to come back. They were Coast Guard. It was their job. They had already committed to going out there and rescuing people. He says, we have to go out there. It's not in the mandate that we have to survive. When you stand there with Jesus Christ and make a commitment, when you stand at that altar, kind of like husband and wife, and they say, I do, and they pledge their vows, they're saying, we are committed to one another. As a Christian, you've got to come face to face before you ever get here that you and Jesus Christ, you're committed to Him. You have to be committed. You don't have to have friends. 
You don't have to have a whole bunch of likes. That's good. That's true. You don't have to have a whole bunch of tweets and a whole bunch of followers and be in the know of all the movies and all the songs and all the stuff. You don't have to be popular and you don't have to have all these people like you and want to buzz around you like a bee. Amen. That's right. Like the uh, brother Peacock always says about flies, you know, you find flies around coconut cakes, around things that are sweet, but you also find flies around other stuff. So don't judge being popular and being something being good with how many flies are buzzing around. Me. Amen. I would rather not have any flies buzzing around me and be what God wants me to be. You must plan, you must purpose, and finally, I want you to notice that you must proceed. Now here in the passage in Daniel chapter number 1, the uh, prince of the eunuchs is talking to him there. He sent his, his, his servant there to go back and forth with Daniel. And the Bible says in verse number um, 12, Daniel says to him, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. Ten days. Ten is a great number for testing in the Bible. You should read about that in the book of Revelation, about being tested ten days. It's a Gentile number, so that's a good thing for us because we're Gentiles. Of course, we're Christians, but you think about that thing 10 days, you say, well, they went through the 10-day deal. But you know what? They had to stand the test and proceed with their commitment every 10 days. I wish I could say, okay, you're going to make a commitment to Jesus this week, and then after that, you're going to have no more pressure the rest of your Christian life. You're going to go on flowery beds of ease, like the song says. It's just going to be easy breezy. I wish I could say that. But you know, it gets harder and harder and harder. The pressure is going to mount and mount and mount. And the devil's forces are going to keep getting bigger and bigger and more and more unified. The church is getting more and more divided the further we go along. The world's getting more and more unified the further we go along. And you're going to feel that pressure. Some of these older guys that have been through college or going through college, I guarantee you they'll tell you about that. You can't stand up in high school, you're not going to make it in college. Forget it. Amen. That's true. That's true, brother. You can't stand up in grammar school, middle school, you're not going to make it in high school. You've got to make the decision. What did Paul say, 1 Corinthians 15? He said, I die daily. Put on the new man every day. Put off the old man every single day. Well, preacher, I read my Bible on Sunday. Why do I need to read it until next Sunday? <laughs> you ever see people that leave their Bible in church? You say, why do they do that? Because that's the only time they need it. <laughs> you need to be in this thing every day. Now, you might not be able to read 100 chapters a day, but you need to be feeding off of the Bible every day. You need prayer every day. You need time with the Lord every day. You need Christian fellowship as much as you can get when you come together with your brother and sister. You need to know, hey, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. There's somebody else being tempted just like I am. Hey, if they can make it through the temptation, maybe I can. Hey, if they made it through high school and they made it through college and they're out there working and they're doing a good job for Christ, maybe I can do it. And then Paul says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You must proceed. There's got to be a continuance. And this is where I believe we failed so many times, especially with young people, because we preach on all the stuff. And we tell you what's bad with all the stuff, and we go in great detail, and man, it looks bad, and you're ready just to throw it all away. But we don't help you to replace it, and we don't help you to proceed, and we don't help you to continue. You've got to have convincing mind, you've got to have a convicting heart, you've got to have a committed will, but you have to have a continuing spirit. You've got to be in this thing for the, for the long haul. I'm looking at you and I saw a lot of you last year. There's a few of you that didn't make it back that were here last year, but I see you here, you're still here, and you're, you're coming back. And that is a blessing to see you coming back to church camp. It is a blessing to a pastor to see members that are faithful year after year after year after year. It shows some stability. It shows some continuing. Hey, I love new Christians. It's a blessing. It sharpens me. I like it. I like the questions. I like the enthusiasm. I like the sometimes even the stupid things they do. So, well, uh, will God forgive me if I do something stupid? Yeah, He forgave us. And we're still doing some stupid stuff. 
But the, the thing is, you see the new Christians come in, but what you want to see, you want to see them grow into mature Christians. It's great to jump up, but how are you going to land? You got a bunch of people jumping up, and I'm not talking about literally, but I'm talking about they get all into it, they get excited, they get going, and they go so fast they run out of steam. We've got to proceed. And I, I used to run. I can't run because i got bad knees anymore. And I used to do about three miles a day. And I was doing about nine-minute miles, ten minutes miles. And that was pretty good. And I enjoyed it. I liked it. My knees got to where I couldn't do it anymore. I never really did any you know, marathons or anything like that. But I know just in a little bit of running that I did, and I did it for about three years, I know that I had to realize my goals, and I couldn't take off in a sprint. And I had to start off. I would walk. I'd get there early, and I'd walk... Uh, I don't know, maybe half a mile, I'd just walk, get warmed up. And then I'd start off, and then I'd get into my, into my pace, what I knew was my pace. And then I knew I would be able to proceed in the right way so I wouldn't you know, get the cramps and everything else. And so I think in the Christian life, we don't even think about that. All we think about is the here and now. We're so carnal, and we think we can, like I said earlier, fight the flesh in the flesh, and we think about just the here and now. Let's stop for a minute, and let's plan. Let's think the right way. Let's think long term. Let's be convinced that the decisions we make today will determine the destiny of tomorrow. Let's think long term here. Let's don't sacrifice the permanent, as Bob Jones Sr. used to say, on the altar of the immediate. And let's purpose, let's be serious about this thing, let's be convinced, convicted and committed about this thing. Now let's take the steps daily to say no to the world. You don't have to be rude. You know, sometimes I think we just want to put it in their face, you know. You don't have to put it... You don't have to put it in their face. I know they're putting it in our face. Jesus Christ was always a gentleman. Even when he bawled the Pharisees out. He had class about how he did things. But you can say no. Just say no. Say no to the world. Say yes to God daily. We're starting up camp. And we have a great opportunity to say yes to the Lord now. Because I'm, I'm convinced if you don't come to this place, we're early on. And like I said, I'm glad you have good parents. I'm glad you have good church, good pastors that try to shield you from those things. I believe in walls and boundaries. But here's the thing. Eventually, you're going to have to start building your own walls. Your parents right now have built some good boundaries and good walls. There's things they're not going to let you do, and that's right. They shouldn't let you do some things. It's their house, not yours. You need to submit to that authority and God's watching how you respond to that authority in your life. And then He wants to see you move from that authority of man to the authority of Him. Not even the authority of your pastor. As preachers, you know what we do? We point everybody to Jesus. We're to be a mouthpiece for God like John the Baptist. We want you, when you're at school, to be able to deal with temptation. You can't say, like, what's that State Farm commercial or something where they hit the button and the guy shows up? And he pops up, and there's your State Farm guy. He's there anytime you need him. You know, like a good neighbor, State Farm, you know, boom. Hey, I need my agent. Boom, there he is. You can't be at school and say, hey, I need, I need uh, Pastor Jay. Hey, I need Pastor Kim. Boom, there he is. It doesn't happen that way. But you know what you can do? You can say, I need the Holy Spirit. He's on the inside. And if you say yes to him now, and you say no to the world now, then it's going to help you on a daily basis as you deal with temptation to be able to say on a daily basis no to the world, yes to God. It's time to... Okay, when we say the world, we're talking about the world system. The Bible says all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The world has to do with the pressures of the world. The world system that says, hey, come over here and taste this. Come over here and experience this. Everybody's doing it. Just a little bit don't hurt. God will understand. God loves everybody. God will understand. It's not a big deal. Don't be a fanatic. Sin is okay. It's tolerable. Just a little bit's all right. The Bible's so old and things have changed with the times and 
The world says it's okay to do whatever. The world system is under the dominance and under control of the devil. And the devil will use and manipulate, manipulate your mind and your heart with the devices and the things of this world to catch your eye, to pull you away from Jesus Christ. And I gave you both of those verses in 1 John because it talks about the will of God. You have the world system and you have the will of God. The will of God's in contrary to the world. It always is contrary. And so, I think this is a great time to start off camp with the idea of being like Daniel. Dare to be a Daniel. There's been a lot of good, great songs like that. Dare to be like Daniel. Stand up. You're young. You say, yeah, but I, you know, I'm outnumbered. So were we. We were outnumbered. You're not the only one going through this. Others have done it. You can do this through Jesus Christ. Like the, the preacher said earlier, you're here and you've got a great spirit here, a great time to make some decisions. Why don't we start tonight and purpose to say no to the world and yes to God. Amen.